Hello, and welcome back to, Kim, to Kim Reed as we continue with Wicked. Child's Play. One afternoon toward the end of summer, Nanny said, There's a beast abroad. I've seen it at dusk several times, lurking about in the ferns. What sort of creatures are native to this hill anyway? You don't find anything larger than a gopher, said Milena. They were at the side of the brook, working at laundry. The small spring wetness had long since ceased. And the drop had clamped Matt's hand down again. The stream was only a thin trickle. Elphaba, who would not come near water, was stripping a pear tree of its stunted crop. She clung with her hands and turned out feet, and threw her head around, catching the sour fruit with her teeth and spinning the seeds and stem on the ground. This is a larger than a gopher, said Nanny. Trust me. Have you bears? It would have been a bear cub, though it could move mighty fast. No bears. There's the room of rock tigers on the fell top, but they tell me not a single one has been sighted in ages, and rock tigers are notoriously skittish and shy. They don't come near a human dweller. A wolf, then? Are there wolves? Nanny let the sheep droop in the water. Could have been a wolf. Nanny, you think you're in the desert. When Hardings is a desolate... I agree, but it's tame on barrenness for all that. You're alarming me with your wolf and your tiger talk. Elphaba, who could not speak yet, made a low growl in the pocket of her throat. I don't like it, said Nanny. Let's finish up and dry these things back to the house. Enough is enough. Besides, I have things I want to say to you. Let's give the child a turtle heart and let's go off somewhere. She shuddered. Somewhere safe. Whatever you say to me, you can say with an earshot of Elphaba, said Elena, you know she doesn't understand a word. You confuse not speaking with not listening, said Nanny. I think she understands plenty. Look, she's smearing fruit on her neck like a cologne. Like war paint, you mean? Oh, dour Nanny, stop being such a goose and scrub those sheets harder. They're filthy. I need hardly ask whose sweat and leakage this is. Oh, oh no, you needn't ask, but don't start moralizing at me. But you know Frex is bound to notice sooner or later. These energetic afternoon naps you take. Well, you always had an eye for the fellow with a decent helping of sausage and hard-boiled eggs. Nanny, come. This is none of your affair. More's the pity, said Nanny Sign. Isn't aging a cruel hoax? I trade my worn-out pearls of wisdom for a good romp with Uncle Flagpole any day. Milena flipped a handful of water in Nanny's face to shut her up. The old woman blinked it, and she said, Well, it's your garden. Plant there what you choose and reap what you may. What I talk about is the child, anyway. The girl was now squatting behind the pear tree, eyes narrowed at something like the distance. She looked, thought Milena, like a sphinx, like a stone beast. A fly even landed on her face and walked across the bridge of her nose. And the child didn't squint or squirm. Then suddenly, she leaped and pounced a naked green kitten after the invisible butterfly. What about her? Melina, she needs to get used to other children. She'll start talking a little bit if she sees that other chicks are talking. Talking among children is an overrated concept. Don't be a glib. You know she needs to get used to other people other than us. She's not going to have an easy time of it anyhow until she sheds her greeny skin as she grows up. She heeds the habits of conversation Look, I give her chores to do. I warble nursery rhymes at her. Melina, why doesn't she respond like other children? She's boring. Some children just are. She ought to have other pups to play with. It would infect her with a sense of fun. Frankly, Frex doesn't expect a child of his to be interested in fun, said Melina. Fun. Fun is counted for an overmuch in this world, Nanny. I agree with him on that. So your dragon snaking with turtle heart is what? A devotional exercise? I said don't be catty, please. Melena focused on the toweling, beating it with annoyance. Nanny would go on about this. She was up to something. And Nanny hit the nail on the head. There crept turtle heart in the cool shadows of the cottage where Melena was tired from her morning's work on the vegetable garden. He covered her with a sense of holiness. It was more than her undergarments that would drop away from her when they were tumbling into the bedclothes. She would lose her sense of shame. She knew this did not file conventional reason. Nevertheless, should a tribunal of unionist ministers called her court for adultery, she would tell the truth. Somehow, Turtle Heart had saved her and restored her sense of grace. 
of hope in the world. Her belief in the goodness of things had been dashed into bits when Green Little Alphaba crawled into being. The trial was an extravagant punishment for a sin so minor she didn't even know she had committed it. It was not the sex that saved her, though the sex was a mighty vigorous, even frightening. It was that Turtle Heart didn't blush when Freck showed up. That he didn't shrink from beastly little Elphaba. He set up shop in the yard, blowing glass and grinding it, as if life had brought him to us to redeem Molina. Whatever else he thought he might have been heading just forgot. Very well, you old interfering cow, said Melina. For the sake of argument, what do you propose? We must take Elphaba to Rush Margin and find some children for her to play with. Melina sat back on her haunches. But you have to be jesting, she said. Slow and deliberate as Elphaba is, at least she's unharmed here. I may not be able to summon such material maternal warmth, but I feed her nanny and I keep her from hurting herself. How cruel to inflict the outside world upon her. A green child will open up invitation for scorn and abuse. And children are wickeder than adults. They have no sense of restraint. We might as well throw her in the lake that she's so terrified of. No, 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 said Nanny, putting her fat hands on her own knees. Her voice was thick with determination. Now I'm going to argue without this, Melina, until you give in. Time and its wisdom will bring you around to my way of thinking. Listen to me. Listen to me. You are only a pampered little rich girl who, who flitted out from music lessons to dance lessons with neighborhood children equally rich and stupid as you. Of course there's cruelty, but Elphaba must learn who she is and she must face down cruelty early. And there will be less of it than you expect. Don't play nanny goddess with me. I won't have it. Nanny is not giving up, said Nanny just as fiercely. I have a long range view of your happiness as well as hers. Believe me, if you don't give the weapons and armor which she and defend herself against scorn, she'll make your life miserable as her and hers will be miserable. And weapons with armor she'll learn from dirty dirty urchins of rush margins. Laughter, fun, teasing, smiling. No, oh, please. I'm not above blackmailing you on this, Melina. I can wander into a rush margins this afternoon and find where Frax is trying to hold his revival meeting and whisper a few words to him, while Frex is busy cranking up religious ardor of Rush Margin sluggers. Would you be interested to know what, what his wife was up to with Turtle Heart? You are a miserable old fiend. You are a foul, unethical bully, cried Melina. Nanny grinned with pride. No later than tomorrow, she said. We'll go tomorrow and get her life started. In the morning, a stiff, unforgiving... Wind from the heights. It pricked up old leaves and the remains of field crops and kitchen gardens. Nanny pulled a shawl across her rounded shoulders and tugged a bonnet over her brow. Her eyes were full of marginal beasts. She kept turning to see a slinking car thing or a vixen dissolve into clots of skeletons leaving debris. Nanny found a black thorn staff as if it were to aid her over stones and ruts, but she kept to be ready to be wielded against some hungry beast. The land is dry and cold, she observed almost to herself, and so little rain. Of course the big beast would be driven from the hills. Let's walk together, no running ahead, little green. They made their way in silence. Nanny fearful, Molina angry at having missed her afternoon dalliance, and Elphaba like a wind-up toy, one foot solidly in front of the other. The margins of the lake had receded, and some of the crude docks were now walkways over pebble and dry and green rot, with the water pulled back beyond their reach. Gonnets was a dark stone cottage with a roof of moldering thatch. Because of a bad hip, Gonnet was no good at hauling the fishing nets or at kneeling over the wasting vegetable gardens. She had a mess of small children in various stages of undress, squalling and sulking and trotting around in the dirty yard in a crack, in a little pack. She looked up and saw the minister's family approach. Good day, and you must be gone it, said Annie brightly. She was pleased to open the gate and be safely inside the garden, even of this hovel. Brother Frexfar told us you would be here. Sweet Lorene, what they say is true said Gonnet, making a holy sign against Elphaba. I thought it was vicious lies, and here she is. The children had slowed to a walk. They were 
Boys and girls, brown faced and white, all of them filthy, all of them keen on something new. Though they kept walking, playing some games of endurance or make believe their eyes never left Alphaba. You know this is Milena, of course you do, and I am their nanny, said Nanny. We we're pleased to meet you, Gonnet, she said a glance at Milena and a bit her upper lip and nodded. Uh, very pleased, I'm sure, said Milena stonily. Can we give some advice, for you will come well recommended, said Nanny. This little girl has problems, and the best of our thinking just doesn't seem to bring forth any good ideas. Gonnet leaned forward, suspicious. The child is green, whispered Nanny confidentially. You may not have noticed being attracted by her charm and warmth, of course. We know the good people of Rush Margins wouldn't let a thing like that border th bother them. But because she is green, she is shy. Look at her, little frightened spring turtle. We need to draw her out, only make her happier, and we don't know how. She's green, all right, said Gonnet. No wonder useless brother Frexwar retired from his preaching for so long. She threw back her head and laughed vicious, rac raucously, unkindly. It's only now how the nerve to take it up again. Well, that's the balls if I ever heard it. Brother Frexbar, and interrupted Melina coldly, reminds us of the scriptures. No one knows the color of a soul. On it, he suggests that I remind you of that very text. Did he now? mumbled Gonnet, chastised. Well then, what do you want with me? Let her play, let her learn, let her come here and be mined by you. You know more than we do, said Nanny. Cunning old cow. Melina. She's trying the rarest of strategies, telling the truth and making it sound plausible. They sat down. I don't know if they take her, said Gonnet, holding out a while. You know my hip doesn't let me hop up and stop them when they get going. Let's see. Of course there'd be some payment, some cash. Melina oh, no, fully agrees, said Nana. Na the barren vegetable plot had caught our attention. There was this was poverty. Melina Nana Nanny gave Alpha a push. We'll go on, child, and see what's in that. The girl didn't budge, didn't blame. The children came near her. There were five boys and two girls. What an ugly pug, said one of the old boys. He touched Alpha on the shoulder. Play nicely now, said Melina, about to leave up, and Nanny kept her hand out to say, stay down. Tag, let's tag, said the boy. Who's the green fly? Nope, not it. The other two shrieked and rushed to brush Alpha with their hands, and then raced away. She stood for a minute, unsure about her own hands, and clenched. And then she ran a few steps and stopped. That's the way healthy exercise, said Nanny, nodding. Gonnet, you're a genius. I know my chick, said Gonnet. Don't say I don't. Hard like the children rushed in again, tapping and darting away, but the girl would not chase them. So they neared her once more. Is it true you are quadling muck frogs? Staying with you too, said Gonnet. Is it true he only eats grass and dung? I beg your pardon, cried Melina. That's what they say, is it true, said Gonnet. He's a fine man, but he's a quaddling. Well, yes. Don't bring him around here then, they spread the plague, said Gonnet. They spread no such thing, said Melina. No throwing, Elfie dear, called Nanny. I'm only saying what I hear. They say... At night, the quadlings fall asleep, and their souls climb out through their mouths and go abroad. Stupid people say a lot of stupid things. Milena was curt and too loud. I've never seen a soul climb out of his mouth while he was sleeping, and I got plenty of opportunity. Darling, no rocks, shrilled Nanny. None of the other children have rocks. Now they do, observed Gonnet. He's the most sensitive person I've ever met, said Milena. Sensitivity isn't... Much use to a fishwife, said Gonnet. How about to a minister and to a minister's wife? Now, there's blood, how vexing, said Nanny. Children, let Elphaba up so I can swipe the cut. And I didn't bring a rag. Gonnet, bleeding is good for them. Make them less hungry, said Gonnet. I rate sensitive, a good sight higher than stupid, said Melina, seating. No biting. Said Gonnet to one of the little boys, and then seeing Elphaba open her mouth to retaliate, raised herself to her feet and, and bat him for no scream. No biting, for the love of mercy! Aren't children divine? said Nanny. And that's the end of that chapter. See you later.